So I, I just got off the phone with our dad, John, and uh, this is gonna be the first time he's ever told his exorcism story from the Baptist Church uh, on camera. He's mentioned it a couple times, and uh, I guess it was a Fourth Watch podcast, and other than that, it's just been some basic stories we've heard. So uh, we're gonna head on over there, we're gonna talk to him, and uh, like I said, this will be the first time he's broken this down. He's agreed to do it on camera, so let's go ahead and do that. Growing up Southern Baptist in a small town in a suburb of Houston, Texas, uh, the occult was booming in those times. In, in the early 90s, the occult, Church of Satan, various types of witchcraft, New Age bookstores, uh, all of these things were really growing in the public eye in that, in that season, in that time period. And, you know, I remember talking to my dad about the occult. I think it started when uh, there was the rumor about a place down in a little levee it was like a, a retention area, a sewage area behind our neighborhood. Hellhole, Hell Hole, exactly. Everyone knew about Hellhole. A lot of stories, a lot of legends uh, that the kids would talk about. And so we explored Hellhole multiple times, flashlights and BB guns. You know, you go down there uh, thinking that you're going to find something as a kid. And there's all types of satanic imagery, pentagrams, uh, goodness, there was so much. Symbols that I didn't even recognize. At the time, I thought maybe they were gang symbols. But in reality, they were occult symbols used in rituals. And that's where a lot of the occult, I, I don't know if they were teenagers or adults, you know, you never really saw it happening. You just heard stories. But after talking to my dad about Hellhole and what we found down there, he began to tell us some stories about dealing with demons and demon possession and the reality of these things. Uh, one of the things he told us was that it was not uncommon in Houston, you know, in the suburbs of Houston during that time period that you would go into a shopping mall or you would go into a grocery store and then when you would come back out and there would be occult literature that had been placed on people's windows. And it was just advertising for different types of occult activities, uh, occult bookstores, uh, co-ops, you know, uh, all those types of things. And so one of the, the highlights was when he sat us down and actually told us stories of his encounters with demons in the Southern Baptist Church. Most Southern Baptist churches don't talk about these types of things. It's very uncommon to hear about actual demonic activity in the Baptist Church. Not to say that it's impossible, it never happens, but uh, growing up, we only really heard about it from our dad. And he had to deal with demonic possession and casting out of demons literally on the grounds of First Baptist Church, Merritt Island, Florida. So growing up, we had had an awareness of the reality of the spirit realm, the reality of demons and devils, uh, but more importantly, how our dad taught us to deal with these things, uh, you know, not from a Catholic perspective, not from a Hollywood perspective, but literally dealing with these things from a biblical perspective, getting in, dealing with the demons, and then getting out. So this is gonna be the first time that he's ever taken uh, an opportunity to talk on camera about uh, one in particular story we're going to have him share with us today. And uh, I'm really excited. I'm glad he agreed to do this. You know, he's talked about it on the Fourth Watch podcast before, but releasing it on video is definitely something he's never done before. So we are excited to, to have him on camera to talk about these things. Hey, Dad. Hey, sir. We appreciate you meeting with us. We know this is going to be the first time that you've uh, told this story on film. Uh, about Big Cheryl and your experience, uh, you know, and as I've already shared that you told us these stories growing up to allow us to realize that this stuff was real and that there's a way to handle it. Uh, so tell us, uh, give us kind of as to the point as possible, but give us the story of how things uh, happened with Big Cheryl, how they progressed and what ended up happening. Well, I was an associate pastor of a church down in Merritt Island, Florida. And we had just come through an experience of real revival in the church and spiritual things were happening. People's lives were changing. And on Saturday, I happened to go to do a little hospital visitation. Uh, when I got there, uh, I saw one of our families. Uh, he worked at the hospital, she was there having lunch, and then their son was with them. They were sitting at the table in the cafeteria and I walked over and began to talk with them. In the middle of the conversation, the wife began to act a little strange. And uh, I asked her a question and she responded very harshly. And so I, I said, well, do you not believe 
that we ought to be dealing with things from the Word of God, that, that the Word of God is true and that we need to live by the Word of God. And she said, she can't hear you. <laughs> I'm going, I'm sorry, what? And she just kind of went comatose on me. The husband began to cry. The boy was just shaking. And I said, what's going on? And the dad said, this is the first time in 20 years that anybody outside of our family has seen this. And I said, well, what do you think it is? He says, I don't know. He said, we've had things in our home that just would blow your mind with things flying through the air and we've have to restrain her and whatnot. And so I looked over and said, Cheryl, what, what's going on? And again, this voice came out and said, she can't hear you coming out of her. And I immediately in my spirit knew that it was not a godly thing, but it was a spiritual thing. And so I looked at her and said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You be quiet. And with that, she kind of got calm, her eyes began to clear. And I said, Cheryl, tell me what's going on. And Cheryl says, well, I've just been, you know, having these kind of things happen to me often. And then again, came out that voice, she can't hear you anymore. And I said, look, I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I command you to be silent. I don't want to hear you say another word. And Cheryl, I'm talking to you and to you alone. And I began to share scripture with her and ask her if she wanted to be delivered. And again, the voice came out and said, said she wants nothing of this. I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You have no authority here in this place. And the voice said, you're afraid of me. And very honestly, I was shook. I, I, I wasn't just as calm as you would expect. And I stood up and I put my hands on the table and I leaned across, got right in her face and just said, boo. And she kind of jumped back like that. I said, I'm not afraid of you because I have the blood of Jesus and I have his word that you're not going to be long in her. I said, you need to understand that your time is limited. And with that, the husband began to just start praising the Lord and the son was praising the Lord. But I knew at that moment that I was in a situation that was far beyond any experience that I'd ever had. Our senior pastor had had some experience, and so I made a phone call to him and said, what do we need to do? And we set a time to meet with her, with some of our godly men. And so at the Monday night of the revival service, the evangelist had us singing praises for about 15 minutes, and then he, he stopped, he said, we need to have an invitation here. And he hadn't preached, nothing else had gone on. But during that week time, up at the altar area of the church, the communion table, the pulpit, we had prayed for days around that during this revival that if anyone came up into that area that was not of God, that was you know under the authority of the devil or whatever, that God would just knock them over. And so that night when the evangelist said, somebody here needs to get some things right with God before we go any farther, and so he stopped and here came Cheryl walking down the aisle and she came up to the altar of the church and the pastor went over to speak to her and that demon began to speak again. She can't hear you and kind of did her arms like this. And he said, you just stand there and you be silent. I command you in Jesus name. Now this was Lynn Turner. This was Lynn Turner, our pastor. Head pastor, right? Our senior pastor. And so she stood there right next to the communion table and the evangelist was Jack Taylor. Jack said, is there anybody else who needs to come? And right about that time, she took her hands and reached over and touched the communion table. And she went flat on her back, just boom, hit the ground and bounced. You know, a couple of our men came running up about that time. This is concrete. It's concrete, concrete, concrete with carpet on top of it. And she just whomp you know, on top of it. And so they came over and she again, the demon within her said, don't touch me and did that. And so she got up, she stood there and they said, let's take her on, you know, to another room and not have to deal with this in a public situation. 
So we went back to this room. When we got in the room, these other men, they all had their Bibles and they, they all began to you know, cry out loud, I rebuke you, I rebuke you, I rebuke you. And they called the name of Jesus and, they, and the demon was speaking and, and this gruff male type voice was coming out of her. And I finally said, I said, man, wait, stop. I said, we're not gonna play Hollywood here. I said, we have authority over the demons and we just need to take that authority right now. So in Jesus name, be silent, be still. And I said, I'm speaking to you demon, that you, your time is limited, you just be still and no more manifestations. We want nothing else out of you. Right about that time, Lynn walked in, our pastor walked in and that because he was the authority in the church at that moment, he walked over and began to take charge. He had two or three of the men read some passages of scripture. He did ask me to open up my Bible and to kind of put it on her back and, and, and just sit there as he began to rebuke the devil and began to speak the word of God into her. And she got very physically ill. She began to get sick and we, we escorted her to the bathroom. She threw up 14 times. And we believe that that was each time one of the demons was being ejected that she was throwing up with that. <clears throat> when she finished that, she washed her face. She was very calm. She was weak. She found uh, she was one of the most pleasant women that we had after that. And the very first thing that she said was, how do I get saved? I want to give my heart to Jesus. And so we led her to faith in Christ, reading about, you know, the wages of sin is death. You know, Jesus died for our sins, that, that he can give us eternal life. We'll believe in him and trust in him. And she gave her heart to the Lord Jesus that night. And there was a total transformation in her life. The next day, she showed up at the church and had flowers for all the secretaries. Uh, they became very active in the church, uh, very much involved. I had never experienced a whole lot of this, but that was my, my very first time to have to deal with somebody that was demon possessed. But then we saw God's hand of deliverance because the power of God, all authority is his. Right. And he tells us in Luke, he said, I'm gonna give you the authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you. So what we have in his word is the promise that the devil, these demons, have no authority over us and that we have the authority over them by using God's word. It wasn't Hollywood. We didn't hold up a crucifix. We didn't cry and scream and no yeah. holy water. No holy water. We just with the word of God, we spoke the word of God in faith and God did the rest. One thing that sticks out to me is that uh, a lot of these, these jokers on TV like Bob Larson and you know whether or not he ever was involved in a real solid ministry in the past, because I feel that in the past Bob Larson did have a lot of uh, seemingly authentic discussion with occultists and whatnot. Things that, that really, when I was a child, I, I loved watching his program. Uh, I'm not sure where he went wrong over the years. He's now talking to demons, yeah. uh, going into great conversations. It's almost comical. A lot of it even seems uh, fake, like they've staged it. But um, you know, there was no conversation other than getting to the root of it and silencing this thing, right. letting it know who you know who you were in Christ and that you had the authority over it by the power of Christ. The stories that that you later heard, or maybe in the hospital when you were talking to the family about. Uh, things flying through the house. Um, I think at one point they told you that they had to hold her down and uh, some of the, in the kitchen, the drawers were coming open. and Right, and pots were flying through, knives were flying through the room. I didn't see that, but that's what the husband said we have experienced for 20 years. Said we've had all types of manifestations going on in our house. The, the other time, if I can take just another minute to tell you, when uh, several months later, one of our church members called me and said that he had a, a friend that had been staying with them and that she had invited in a spirit guide. Oh boy. And that now she's afraid of what's going on and wanted to know if I could, you know, have a conversation. And they came over to the church on a Sunday afternoon, sat in the youth center where my office was, 
And as he introduced me, he had had this girl and her boyfriend and then the, the church member. And I said, well, listen, before we start, let's just have a word of prayer. And I began to pray and I began to speak the word of God boldly. And I began to talk about the blood of Jesus and how God has you know, power over all of the enemy and that the enemy has no place there. She screamed so loudly that it was like all the blood had run out of her boyfriend's face because I opened my eyes and looked and he was as pale as a sheet. And I continued to pray. And when I finished praying, I looked at him and I said, son, do you know Jesus? He said, no, but I want to. <laughs> and so I told my friend that had brought them in, I said, would you take him to that other room and lead him to Jesus? He said, I'll be glad to. They went to the other room and the girl came and was standing across from me, actually sitting across from me. And I said, I, I just want to start by giving you the word of God. The Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And she said, he isn't Lord. And I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I'm not commanding the girl at this moment. I'm commanding you demon. You have to kneel and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I took my Bible and turned it and put it over in her lap. I said, I said to the girl, I said, would you just read this scripture that says that? Would you read it? And she immediately dropped my Bible and put her hands up over her eyes and again screamed bloody murder. And I, I pulled her hands down and her eyes were totally bloodshot. Looked like somebody had poked her in the eyes so she couldn't read. And I said, well, then I'll just read it to you. And I began to read, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now I demand you in the name of Jesus to confess that he is Lord. And this voice, he is Lord. I said, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Jesus is Lord. I said, I need you to say it a little bit louder. Jesus is Lord. I said, now on your knees, and again, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And I said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave this girl and never come back. And with that, she said, Jesus Christ is Lord. She said it in her voice and natural. And she, she called upon the name of Jesus and was gloriously saved. About that time, the boyfriend and the other friend came into the room and I said, Reed, did you lead him to Christ? He said, oh yes. And I said, you know, she just received Christ as her savior and the two of them embraced and their lives were literally totally changed. So, you know, there have been some minor manifestations, but as best that I can tell, you don't have to put up with that. You know, Jesus said to some of the demons that came up when they began to cry out, he said, be quiet be still, be silent. And they had to stop at the command of Christ. So it was not jumping through hoops and playing all these games. It was just dealing with the issue that needed to be dealt with. You know, uh, if you had to consider that being Southern Baptist, you know, with, with a background in the Southern Baptist Church uh, and, and most of your early ministry in Southern Baptist churches, uh, these things don't really seem to get brought up very frequently. Uh, why do you think that's the case? Well, I believe some people are just afraid of dealing with it. Uh, partly, I believe that people say, well, you don't want to become a demon hunter, you know? And what do you find out when you look at the movies, they always have this one little group that are gonna be the exorcists. You know, they're the ones that are experienced at it. Well, Jesus literally told his disciples, when you're out there going and you're preaching the gospel, cast out the demons. You know, he said, listen, I'm gonna give you the authority over him, just go ahead and do it. Uh, there was a church in our association up in Titusville, Park Avenue Baptist Church. Peter Lord was the pastor there. And they had had some experiences with this. I don't know necessarily as to why, but they had had experiences with this. And the next week I had lunch with their youth pastor. Right? We had a mutual friend and, and we came together. He says, I want you to tell you know, the youth pastor from Park Avenue about what you just did. 
And so I explained to him just like I've just told you. And he came back and he said, if I were writing a textbook, he said, what you just did led by the Holy Spirit was textbook in how to deal with the demonic. And so I, I felt, you know, that it was just a validation of what we've experienced. You know, uh, in closing, uh, when I when I watch YouTube videos of, of so-called deliverance ministers or or TV shows for that matter, um, it seems that there's a whole lot of people want to train people in all of these man-created steps. Now, even if they're inspired by Scripture, uh, you know, I just I feel like a lot of people put a lot they put too much emphasis on training for deliverance rather than just knowing who we are in Christ, knowing that He's already declared the victory, that we've got the power and authority in Christ to stand up, to silence these things, and to cast them out. Now granted, we are told um, it can be a dangerous situation for, demons to get, for, for a demon to get cast out of a man, and then that person not get filled with the Holy Spirit and right. get saved, because it says that demon will come back with seven more yes. wicked than himself which kind of gives a strange idea that there's some type of a hierarchy of demonic power in the spirit realm. Uh, but that's one aspect. But the other aspect is that a lot of people want to have, they want to get in and have communication. As we mentioned earlier with Bob Larson and some of these other guys, that they tend to showboat around the issue. Um, I think one of the challenges there is that as Christians, I, I'm fully convinced we cannot be demon possessed once we have the Holy Spirit in us. Right. However, we can be demonically oppressed Yes. And I think that some of these guys who are sincerely wrong, you know, their, their heart is in the right place, but they're just, they're, they're mis, misled by whoever trained them, whoever their mentor was. They get in there and start playing games and they want to have a conversation with this thing and they want to go back and forth with these, uh, you know, insult competitions, uh -huh. which is what it can turn into. What ends up happening then is I believe if they do cast the demon out, there's a good chance that that demon or other demons that, that were involved in the, in the room could easily follow that pastor home and that guy could be oppressed because of the way he handled himself. Now, I just, I think people need to be very careful with deliverance. Kind of when James says, not many of you should become teachers. We have to know the word, know how to live it, know how to act on it, know how to be led by the Spirit of God. And uh, I think that people don't need to just run out to be a demon hunter. However, I think that people who are truly called to ministry need to be equipped. Yes. Because at any time, just like we're supposed to be uh, ready to preach the gospel in season and out of season, we need to be equipped to be able to handle demonic activity in season and out of season. And I think that if we don't ever touch on these things, if, we're not, if we don't deal with some of the darker issues, I think what's going to happen is we can, we can tend to be walking this smooth line of ministry that never deals with the real issues. We always focus on the good and the, and the positive rather than rightly dividing the whole Word of God. And a lot of pastors, uh, they'll say, well, you know, we just, we never have any issues like that in our church. And it's possible because you're not teaching anything that is rattling the cages of the demons. You're not teaching anything that's gonna bring conviction into the lives of people in your church that are dealing with demonic stuff. That's my take. You wanna have any closing thoughts on that? I think part of it is what you just mentioned, that, that people figure, figure that if they can just ignore it, it'll go away. Uh, others have become to where what's going on in their church is not of God anyway. Uh, we've got so many of our churches that are so watered down and the Holy Spirit doesn't have to show up because they go by the order of service. They go by the program. Even their sermons are so designed to the T that they can you know, go along with their outline on a television. Uh, but I think what happens in that, that we have our churches that have ignored it. And as many have said, the devil's not worried about them because he's already got them where he wants them. But then you have a church where begin, the Holy Spirit begins to work in such a way that the devil then has to give some counterfeit and has to show his own signs and wonders. But then I'll also throw this idea out. There are some people, when you mention people that get caught up with wanting to teach how to do it. And we've got people wanting to teach you how to speak in tongues, want to teach you how to get a word of prophecy, how to teach you to get a word of knowledge. If those are gifts of the Holy Spirit, shouldn't the Holy Spirit be the one that does that? And so if God has given us the power and the authority, and He said, I, you know, you'll have the power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be witnesses unto me in both Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And so if the Holy Spirit is our teacher, and if we're listening to the Holy Spirit, then He will equip us for every circumstance that comes our way. 
and therefore we're going to be instant in season and out of season because our teacher is not somebody who's on a on a, an ego trip our teacher is the holy spirit who is the same one who breathed the word of god into existence through the writers that we have that same Holy Spirit's within us. Dad, thank you so much for taking the time to tell these stories uh, on film for the first time. And uh, we sure love you. Love you too, son.